thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part 5, The Jesuits of Adam Weishaupt, A Human Devil by Gerald B. Winrod. The Jesuits. Weishaupt was trained as a Jesuit. He later renounced the organization. He may or may not have been sincere in his change of attitude, but the fact remains that the fierceness of this Roman Catholic militaristic order fastened its influence upon him. It left an impression that contributed to all of his future investments and decisions. A short detour into the nature and purposes of this organization will give an insight into the forces which helped to mold the character of the man. The story of the Society of Jesus, or the Jesuits, is interesting, but far from inspiring. It is the army of the Roman Church and has behind it a trail of protestant blood which it will never be able to wash away. It is a vast, powerful, worldwide machine with a reputation for moving swift and terrible. A modern writer calls them the Black International. Credit is given for the founding of the order to Ignatius Loyola on April 5, 1541. It will be recalled that Loyola was previously arrested by the Spanish government for subversive activities as a Gnostic. He was not convicted. Disraeli, the Jewish premier of England, said in his book Koningsby, you never observe a great intellectual movement in Europe in which the Jews do not greatly participate. The first Jesuits were Jews. The Jesuits make their headquarters in the Vatican at Rome. The head of the order is known as the General. His position is that of Chief and Commander, and he wields absolute power over the members who are pledged to blind obedience. The General claims his authority from the Pope. Each member makes a series of vows and takes certain secret oaths. The fourth oath is known to be one of special allegiance to the Pope, promising to go in obedience to him wheresoever and whithersoever he may demand. Jesuits have been dubbed the secret servicemen of the Vatican because the general of the Jesuits always wears a black garb. He is familiarly known as the Black Pope. There have been times when the Pope have refused to countenance Jesuitical crimes and have curtailed or disbanded the order. An instance of this kind occurred on July 21st, 1773, when the Pope abolished them at the demand of the governments of France, Spain, Portugal, Naples, and Austria. But they were soon back in the fold stronger than ever. Today, they are reported to be active in all parts of the world. In her treatise, Occult Theocracy, Lady Queensborough takes the following quotation from a manuscript, which title can be read on your screen, which she found in the Rue Richelieu Library at Paris. Initiation from this, as well as other works, we gather some of the ceremonies with which aspirants were initiated into the order, having in nearly all Roman Catholic countries succeeded in becoming the educators of the youth. They were able to mold the youthful mind according to their secret aims. If then, after a number of years, they detected in the pupil a blind and fanatic faith, Conjoined with exalted pietism and indomitable courage, they proceeded to initiate him. In the opposite case, they excluded him. The proofs lasted 24 hours, for which the candidate was prepared by long and severe fasting, which, by prostrating his bodily strength, inflamed his fancy, and, just before the trial, a powerful drink was administered to him. Then the mystic scene began, diabolical apparitions, evocation of the dead, representations of the flames of hell, skeletons, moving skulls, artificial thunder and lightning, in fact, the whole paraphernalia and apparatus of the ancient mysteries. If the neophyte, who was closely watched, showed fear or terror, he remained forever in the inferior degree, 
but if he bore the proof well, he was advanced to a higher degree. At the initiation into the second degree, Scholasticy, the same proofs, but on a grander scale, had to be undergone. The candidate was led with his eyes bandaged into a large cavern, resounding with wild howlings and roarings which he had to traverse, reciting at the same time prayers specially appointed for that occasion. At the end of the cave, he had to crawl through a narrow opening, and while doing this, the bandage was taken from his eyes by an unseen hand, and he found himself in a square dungeon, whose floor was covered with a mortuary cloth, on which stood three lamps, shedding a feeble light on the skulls and skeletons ranged around. This was the Cave of Evocation, the Black Chamber, so famous in the annals of the Fathers. Here, giving himself up to prayer, the neophyte passed some time, during which the priest could, without his being aware of it, watch his every movement and gesture. If his behavior was satisfactory, all at once, two brethren, representing archangels, presented themselves before him, without his being able to tell whence they had so suddenly started up. A good deal can be done with properly fitted and old trap doors, and, observing perfect silence, bound his forehead with a white band soaked with blood and covered with hieroglyphics. They then hung a small crucifix round his neck and a small satchel containing relics of what did duty for them. Finally, they took off all his clothing, which they cast on a pyre in one corner of the cave and marked his bodies with numerous crosses drawn with blood. At this point, the Hierophant with his assistants entered and, having bound a red cloth round the middle of the candidate's body, the brethren, clothed in blood-stained garments, placed themselves beside him and drawing their daggers, formed the steel arch over his head. A carpet being then spread on the floor, all knelt down and prayed for about an hour after which the pyre was secretly set on fire, the further wall of the cave opened, the air resounded with strains, now gay, now lugubrious, and a long procession of specters, phantoms, angels, and demons followed past the neophyte like the supers in a pantomime. Whilst this farce was going on, the candidate took the following oath, in the name of Christ crucified, I swear to my burst the bounds that, that yet unite me to father, mother, brothers, sisters, relation friends, to the king, magistrates, and any other authority which I may have sworn fiatly, obedience, gratitude, or service, I renounce. The place of my birth, henceforth to exist in another sphere, I swear to reveal to my new superior, whom I desire to know, what I have done, thought, read, learnt, or discovered, and to observe and watch all that comes under my notice. I swear to yield myself up to my superior, as if I were a corpse, deprived of life and will. I finally swear to flee temptation and to reveal all I succeed in discovering, well aware that lightning is not more rapid and ready than the dagger to reach me wherever I may be. The new member, having taken this oath, was then introduced into a neighboring cell, where he took a bath and was clothed in the garments of new and white linen. He finally repaired with the other brethren to a banquet where he could, with choice food and wine, compensate himself for his lost abstinence and the horrors and fatigues he had passed through. Events in the history of the Jesuits seem to bear out the supposition that both Jews and Catholics have at times united their efforts in its ranks to bring about destruction of Protestantism. To illustrate, during the years 1573 to 1585, the International General was a Belgian Jew by the name of Eberhard Mercurian. Thus, we see a Jew Jesuit and a Gentile Pope working together, a mutual adulation society. 
in a frantic effort to put Protestantism on the gallows. The present general is a Pole by nationality, his name being Vladimir Luduchowski. The real reason for establishing the Society of Jesus was to check the progress of the Reformation, which broke upon the world in the little town of Wittenberg, Germany, October 31, 1517. While the Jesuits failed in their attempt to blot Protestantism out of existence, yet they did succeed in stopping the growth of the movement in southern Germany and other countries in Europe. No one has taken the trouble to deny that the order exists down to the present time for the same purpose, namely a flank attack upon Protestants and their faith. The leading principle of the Jesuits sound good enough, love of God and their fellow men, but into their constitution there was written another principle. The end justifies the means. In other words, when occasion demands it, any moral law may be transgressed to promote the interest of the church. Someone has called this arrangement holy hellishness. Many vicious crimes have been laid at the door of the Jesuits in the past, notably the gunpowder plot in England and the killing of the Huguenots in France. I recall while being shown through the Parliament buildings in London, we paused at a certain place and was told that if the gunpowder plot had been carried out in 1605, as planned by the Jesuits, the king and members of the parliament would have been destroyed. 36 barrels of gunpowder, more than a ton, had been stored in the basement ready to be exploded when the sessions of government convened. The plot was not discovered until two days before parliament met. The scheme was traced to the Jesuits and some of their leaders in England were put to death as a result. But the heinous crime of which the Jesuits have ever been guilty was the slaughtering of the unsuspecting Huguenots on Sunday, August 24th, 1572. It was on the day of St. Bartholomew, a quiet Sunday in Paris. Suddenly the bells of St. Germain began to ring. I shall never forget the chill that came over me as I walked through the door of this building for the first time. Realizing as I did that this was the place where the signal was given to massacre the protestants, like a cat springs upon an unsuspecting bird. So the Jesuits sprang upon the defenseless protestant. Kalani, the leader of the Huguenots, was among those put to death in this awful orgy of blood. From Paris, the massacre soon spread to other cities, and it has been established that no less than 100,000 Protestants were wiped out. Weishaupt may have tried consciously to separate himself from the Jesuits, but the early influence of the order lingered with him throughout his life. Even if he did divorce himself from the visible organization, he had already assimilated its intangible principles, that he drew upon the Jesuits for methods and nomenclature is readily admitted by careful students of the man and his work. Gould, in his History of Freemasonry, remarks, he, being wise up, had unconsciously imbibed that most pernicious doctrine that the end justifies the means. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.